Matthew Weiss here, weiss-sound.com and Weiss Advice on YouTube here on behalf of Produce Like a Pro. This is going to be all about mixing hip hop low end. So I'm going to play a little bit of this record just so we know what we're starting from. And then I'm going to sort of paint some ideas. Now, here's the thing. There is not one way to do this. It's always going to, to depend on the record. And there's always going to be records that are exceptions to the rules. So I'm going to try to make that clear as I go, but just keep in mind that at the end of the day, you always do have to use your own discretion and your own determination because sometimes a record will throw a curveball at you and you don't necessarily want to do things the prescribed way. All right, so this is a typical kind of um, trap style low end. It's a trunk rattler. It's it's supposed to be big and boofy. And in terms of just the general faders up levels that were provided here by the producer, I would say we're probably in the right ballpark. Maybe the vocals are a hair low, something like that. But generally speaking, the levels are about right. Typically speaking, you want to have the low end taking up a pretty significant amount of the space. If it feels like the low end is a little bit overwhelming or a little bit too much, it's actually probably just right. So. I want to go through a little bit of setup first and then start getting into the specifics of it. Uh, down here on my submix groups, I have my submix where everything comes to, and then I have my stems. Uh, normally, I would have bass, drums, melodics, effects, vocals, right? Typical five stem sort of setup. However, instead of having it being the bass, for my very first bus, I actually have it called low end. And the reason is because with hip hop, I do things a little bit differently than other genres. I tend to put the, whatever is in the low end, whether it's synth bass, kick, 808, a bass guitar, whatever it might be, all of that stuff that's in the low end, I tend to send to the bus together. It does kind of mess up doing a typical five stem uh, print, but I do find that it is useful because a lot of the times the entire low end wants to be processed as one idea or one cohesive unit. So I do have my kick and my 808 going to the low end as opposed to having my kick going to the drum bus. So a little bit weird. Uh, in terms of everything else, you know, just basic color coordination so I can look at what I'm seeing very easily. Uh, also typical of hip hop, this is a very minimalistic production. There's not a whole lot going on. It's mostly drums and percussion and then a guitar and uh, an 808. And there you go, vocals. So now let's start listening to the low end and kind of figure out where we're at. We always want to do an assessment because sometimes we get something where the low end is just like spot on perfect and we don't really have to do anything. Sometimes the low end can be really off and we want to make sure that we're just acknowledging what's going on before we start to do anything. So I want the the presence of the low end to be really big. I want it to really like shake the speaker and I want the the sustain of it to be very present. But at the same time, I do want the attack of the low end to be really tight and really punchy, uh, pretty typical. What I'm hearing here is we have some timing issues and timing is actually probably one of the most fundamentally important aspects of getting the low end correct in hip hop. I'm not talking about timing in terms of like macro timing where we think of like, you know, 30 second notes, 16th notes, those kinds of things. I'm talking about like the timing within several milliseconds where we want to make sure that the kick and the 808 are really hitting in time and presenting themselves as one idea. Here we can actually hear what's happening when that doesn't happen. There's a flaming going on between the attack of the 808 and the attack of the kick. Now, I'm not going to say that this is inherently a bad thing. It could work, so we stay open-minded, but in this particular case, to me, when I hear the rest of the record, it just kind of sounds like it's all running together. Like, not terrible, but it just sounds a little mushy. So let's zoom in here on the wave shapes, and let's try and figure out what's going on with the timing, because we can see that the kick and the 808, 
808 are both hitting on the grid, right? In fact, they're both quantized exactly to the grid. But if we really look at this wave shape, we can kind of tell that this segment right here is the actual attack of the 808, and this is some low end that precedes it. So there's almost a low end that rolls into the 808 before the 808 actually strikes. A little bit weird, but we need to eliminate that. So I'm going to go to the very, very first hit, and I'm going to create a chop right here right on this end point, and I'm going to delete and move it so that it hits right on the initial transient. And I'm also going to do a fade on this very first hit so that we don't get an unwanted click. So now that we've done that, that should eliminate the flaming. Now it's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect. The next thing we want to do is we want to get these two similar sounds to really hit in a connected way. So one thing I'm going to do immediately is I'm just going to turn the overall sample up. We're going to go with the kick up about 4 dB, see how that sounds. I think that's way better right off the bat. And we might adjust that level a little bit later, but I, I need to hear that punch, that attack, and we're just not getting it when the kick is underneath the 808. Sometimes certain records it works where the kick is kind of just reinforcing the 808. Maybe this is one of those records, but I don't really think so. The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure to check the polarity, right? So right now I have it out of phase. I'm going to just hit, listen to the first couple of notes with it in phase, with it out of phase, and see if it makes a difference and try and pick which one sounds better. So once I flip it back to its normal polarity, I think that it does sound better. I don't think it's a massive difference, but I do hear it as punching a little bit better. Uh, sometimes this will make a large difference. So anytime you have a kick in 808 layer, really any basses layered together in a hip hop record, it's always worth just flipping the phase on something, see if that makes a difference in how well it punches through. Sometimes the results will surprise you. Subtle, but important. It's also not something that we can easily fix with EQ. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a, a 10 sample nudge. And I find that similar to what I just did, nudging the kick either earlier or later by just a micro amount of time, you know, anywhere from zero to a hundred samples will tend to make a difference. So I'm going to play with that. I'm going to see what happens if I move this. Let's just try like, 30 behind the beat or back in time and see if that sounds any better. Honestly, it does make a difference. I'm not sure if I like it more or less, but I think I like it less. Let's go into, let's do 30 sample increments and let's do some A-being. Let's go the other direction here. Let's, uh, Give ourselves some room. Hop back in here. Okay, let's go earlier. Not a huge difference there. Let's go 60 samples earlier. So it's definitely losing a little punch. Let's go 60 samples later. To me, I hear a lot more punch when I do that. I like that. That actually sounds pretty darn good. I'm going to do one more nudge just to see what happens, but I think we might have found a better spot. Yeah, I, I moved it 30 samples behind, so now it's a total of 90 samples behind. That punch went right away. It's gone. But just 60 samples? You hear how much of that comes back? So that can really make a difference. So this 60 sample nudge, pretty, pretty important. This isn't stuff that you can really fix with EQ. So this is why I'm starting with this stuff that kind of seems like, well, what the heck is even going on, right? So if, if I go back to how things were originally, and then fix all that timing stuff,
What a difference. So phase and time is really our foundation. We can't EQ, compress, get levels, or anything like that until we've actually gotten everything in phase and working together coherently as much as possible. And I want to add one idea to this. Sometimes I'll get a record where when the 808 changes notes, the kick will suddenly flip out of phase because the waveform is now completely different. When that is the case, I will go in and I will actually select that one kick and I will invert the polarity just destructively on that one kick to make sure that it stays giving us that really good solid punch even on that one hit. And the good thing is, is that hip hop is usually loop based. So we can, once we've got that going, we can kind of copy and paste that through. So it's not super arduous and time consuming, but I, I do do that just because I really want to get the absolute best out of the low end. Okay, so now let's give a listen in context of the record. We're going to start to figure out our tones, if everything is coming through correctly, if things are maybe a little masked, what that might be. So my general assessment is that this is not bad. If we didn't change anything, it would be working pretty well. And that's a good sign. That means that things have been produced pretty correctly. I would say that the guitar is sort of shifted a little bit into the lower range, maybe more than it needs to be. So in order to get the low end to come out at the best that it can, I need to open things up and really make as much room as possible in the bottom of the range. And sometimes even a little above that, in a lot of genres, like if this was like a, a more of like a rock song or something like that, I probably would allow the guitar to extend lower. But because this is hip hop and it's so important for that low end to be so dominant, I'm going to make some changes here. So I'm going to grab an EQ. And we see right on the graph here, it, and we can hear very obviously that there's a very strong buildup around about 250, 300 hertz. Now, that's not really the bass range. That's more like the low mids. But in order to get the bass to come through the way that we want, we're going to actually want to make some room in that range and open it up and then shift the energy up into a higher octave so that we can kind of still have that same presence of the guitar and same body of the guitar, but without necessarily having that low end extension that's going to cover up some of the kick in the bass. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of just slapping it together here, but we're kind of going to go from this to this. So something more along those lines. So let's pull in our low end elements and let's bypass this and see if we're on the right track. And so if we listen to the guitar, it sounds like the guitar is getting a little bit smaller, but if we listen to the kick in the 808, we hear the kick in the 8 come through a lot more presently. So I'm going to experiment with that. I think I'm also going to use a different EQ. I think I'm going to use the Eosis Air EQ just because I think I can pull the body of the guitar forward in a broad way a little bit better with this EQ. There we go. So the nice thing about doing it this way is that I actually get both the kick, bass, and guitar to all come forward together, and so the whole record feels more forward entirely. So I'm winning on every front here by making this EQ move. So I'll go through the record and anything else that might be masking the low end, I'm going to do the same basic idea. If it's something where we really don't need the low end at all, 
I might end up high passing it if it's something where we do kind of need the low end. Like this guitar does need that low end. It can't not exist, but it just doesn't need that much of it. Well, that's when I'll use bells and shelves to kind of make it feel a little bit more naturally blended. So now let's get the kick and the 808 to really have the perfect EQ tonal relationship. Uh, kicks and 808s are a little bit backwards if you're coming from a more traditional genre like, like rock, jazz, uh, something along those lines, because the 808 is really living in the sub. There's a lot of sub bass energy in hip hop and uh, other similar genres like reggaeton or even like EDM or, or pop that's been influenced by hip hop. So to get that right, you know, normally the kick would be the lowest element and the bass, bass guitar is basically an octave below your rhythm guitar and your primary guitars, but it's a little different in hip hop. Typically the kick is actually kind of living in that sort of central 100 Hertz to 150 Hertz area. And the 808 will very frequently be a whole octave below that and, you know, pretty low in the scale. So we're voicing the kick and the 808 pretty differently. And even if I just solo these, you'll hear that that's natural to the sound that we're actually hearing. So you can hear that that kick, it has sub to it, but a lot of that kick is actually living above the primary bass range. Whereas with this 808, I mean, the 808 is pretty grungy, so we are getting a lot of overtones and there's definitely a big presence in the upper mids and, and mids, but the actual fundamental of that is pretty darn low. And it, we can just pull up, say, like uh, an analyzer and you'll see that that low end is <laughs> 34 hertz. 34 hertz. <laughs> That's where we're at. So it, it is a very different context than a more acoustic based genre. So we want to make sure that the power of the 808 and the power of the kick are living in their correct registers. The one thing we want to watch out for and be really wary of is not over separating the sounds. Yes, we want to be able to hear the kick. Yes, we want to be able to hear the 808. But really, these two sounds are actually meant to work together and the kick and the 808 are really reinforcing each other. We can listen to that and we can hear it pretty clearly. Right? They're part of the same idea. So we want to make sure that they actually blend. So I do want to voice things in a way where it really complements the strength that each element is bringing, but I don't want to do it in a way where I over separate the sounds and, and thus ultimately thin the arrangement. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up air EQ again, and we don't need all of the sub that's in the kick. We've got plenty of sub in the 808. What we do need is a little bit more of that forward mid range, everything that goes from like maybe 150 Hertz, which is like the lower mid of the kick. Uh, it's technically not mid range, it's bass range, but it's the lower mid of the kick. And then going all the way up to like 1K, that's what's gonna come forward. And we're going to keep the energy kind of living the same way simply by removing sub at the same time. So let's get rid of a little bit of stuff that's happening under, say, like, I don't know, let's start with 100 hertz, see how that flies. And then let's do a big, broad boost. Let's go, let's go like 800 hertz-ish. And let's see how that sounds. Let's hear it just on the kick. So when we hear that in solo, it might sound a little anemic. I think the real question is, how is it going to sound with the 808? So notice that when I bring the 808 in, it doesn't really sound anemic. Now, I think that we can smooth things out a little bit. I think our corner frequency is maybe a little bit high on that low shelf. So let's take it down to like 85. Maybe that's a little bit better. And I think that I'm going to shift this into water mode, which is going to kind of help the two curves sort of blend together and extend together. I think that's going to help. But actually, I feel like I got the basic levels of the boost and cut more or less right.
So before or after. And actually, because of the nature of the kick, we're actually lowering the overall peak level of the kick by doing this, even though it's bringing everything forward. So I don't think that we need to do too much more. I, if we wanted to make room for the kick, then maybe we would do something like, let's get rid of this. We really don't need that there. We would probably you know, find that sort of central mid-range that's really bulky in the 808 and cut it. But the problem is, is that once we get that separation, even if we end up doing makeup gain, it ends up sort of sounding like it's not glued. I mean, it's not bad. I don't hate it. I think for certain contexts, it would probably work, but I kind of feel like... Oh, let's split the difference, actually. I think that maybe I just went a little too far, but actually making a little bit of room here is actually nice. Let's do like one dB, dB and a half, something like that. And let's do our output gain at like about the same amount. Yeah, I can kind of dig that. Let's hear how it sounds in the mix. So here's without that. I like it actually. And let's uh let's get rid of that completely. Let's play up a little bit of those upper tones. Those are kind of nice. And a little bit of the actual sub range. Yep, more sub, believe it or not. Nice. Sounds pretty good. Now, sometimes when we're EQing things, it is worth just taking another shot at the phase real quick, just to see if maybe some things got moved out uh, into maybe not the best position. When you EQ something, you do inherently change the phase of it. So we can kind of adjust by just checking the timing. So I'm gonna lay this back another 30 samples and see if that makes things sound better or worse. I don't think that improved things. No, definitely not. And now I'm gonna nudge it 30 seconds or 30 samples earlier, see if that improves things. Not really. So we're still probably in the best place. It, it is worth noticing, though, that we don't just simply change the punch. We are also changing sort of the context when we do that. When I laid it back 30 samples, it became a lot mellower, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I do want to keep it punchy, and that's usually the way that I want to go here. So the last thing that I want to do is I want to bring some tap to the kick. Basically, the kick sounds really good except it's hard to kind of piece out in terms of just hearing it because there isn't a lot of top end to it. And it's very round sounding. So I'm going to pull up a virtual mix rack here. And I'm going to pull up an EQ. And we're just going to add some top end. I'd say 4K is probably about right. We might need to add a lot because this is a very, very round kick sound. Yeah, like I can I can add 10 dB of top end here and it doesn't sound like it's overly top endy. So I I think maybe a little bit of the 10k, like a good amount, and then a pinch of the 4k. Yeah, that that sounds about right. And you know, this is going to depend on the kick, right? Cuz every kick is different. So, you know, you have to sort of use your judgment if there's already a lot of like top end and, and tap in the kick, then we don't need to necessarily do this. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some distortion to it. And I'm not going to like, I'm going to cook it, but then I'm going to blend it in parallel. So it's just a little bit. So 
So that clipping, that hair that's showing up, that's what I'm going for. Now, right now it's too much. It sounds like I've, I've messed up the kick. Like, it's not horrible because the 808's distorted, but I kind of feel like having the cleaner kick with the distorted 808 is kind of what's making it work. But if I just take this and I move it down this mix knob to like 50% or less, suddenly we start getting something that makes a lot more sense and grabs the ear a lot better. And in the mix. Now we've got that really, really big sizable low end, right? So from here, I feel like there's only really one more thing to address, and that's when the kick and the 808 are not playing together. And frequently you'll find in a trap arrangement that the 808 will play by itself for certain sections, and then the kick will come in to just make the whole record lift up. And we've got that going on here for sure. So in order to deal with that, I'm actually going to duplicate this track and I'm going to create different sections. So anywhere where the 808 is on its own is going to be one and anywhere where the 808 is with the kick is going to be another. Now, when I hear the 808 on its own, I don't mind that mid scoop, like the, the EQ curve that I got to it. I feel like that's going to help give it some lift when the kick comes in because it'll help fill out that range. And that contrast is the point. Here's without it. Yeah, like it almost feels too contrasty right now because it suddenly lifts into this like much bigger section. And I kind of want, like it is supposed to lift, but I don't want it to lift so much that it feels like the 808 on its own is just too bland or isn't doing what it needs to do. What I'm going to do is grab FG Bomber, which is a transient designer. And there actually is a kick sound kind of in the 808. It's part of the envelope. I'm going to use FG Bomber to bring that knock out. Okay, yeah, I like it on fat mode, it's not surprising. And now let's dial this back to maybe about 40%. Without it. With. Just take a dB off to kind of match it a little bit better. So now it's gonna have some transient as it plays even without that kick. We're starting to get there. We're starting to shape up with something that really feels like it's coming together. So to wrap up this tutorial, what I want to do now is go to the actual mix that I'm doing for the client here, where I'm taking a little bit more time with my decisions and doing a little bit more experimentation. What I just showed you was a demonstration of ideas, but I was doing it, of course, quickly so that things weren't getting bogged down. What I want to do now is go over what I actually am doing <clears throat> and what I've actually decided to stick with for the presentation that the client is going to hear. So first I'm going to play through it and then I'm going to take a look at my settings, break them down and sort of explain where they're coming from and compare it to what we've just learned.
Okay, so let's take a look. First, let's start with the guitar here because it's gonna be a little easier to break down. Uh, we have some slightly more meticulous EQ, but here you can see that I'm taking out some of the low end here, uh, a little narrow notch where there's a very distinct resonance as well as a broader cut, and then we're building up some of the mids and upper mids. So not exactly the same as what we did before, but same kind of idea. Then that idea is continued with these two plugins here, the virtual channel and the custom series EQ. So here you can see that I'm taking out a fair amount of a low shelf at 100 hertz. The fundamental of the guitar is much higher. It's in the 250 to 300 hertz range, but because of the breadth of the shelf, it is actually attenuating that range. So we are cutting a little bit more there. And then the other thing is, is that I'm using this USA channel here on the virtual channel, and that has a slightly tighter low end and exaggerates the top a little bit more. So it's also kind of doing that same movement of bringing the lows subtly down and the mids and upper mids subtly forward. So it's all working toward that same idea. If I take off the effects, we have this. Put them on. That nice little double action of both bringing the guitar forward and also opening up the low end, which is great. All right, so now let's take a look at our kick. I've made a little note, kick is flaming, uh, 70 samples to the right. So again, shifting the samples, I think we ended up with 60 when we were doing it before. So this one ended up being 70. And let's take a look at our settings. First of all, adding 3 dB of gain from where the producer originally set it because more low end equals better. Then EQ, here it is, almost exactly the same as what we did before. A little bit milder settings, it looks like, and the corner frequency is 80 hertz. So it's a lower corner frequency overall, uh, and a slightly lower corner frequency for the mid boost, which is at 690. But again, similar idea, cutting a little bit of the sub, bringing a little bit of the mids forward, because that's what needs to be supplied by the kick. Then if we take a look at the 808, Looks like I'm using FG Bomber to bring out the knock of the 808 on the part where the kick is layered, which kind of makes sense too, because they're kind of working together. And then I'm using a pull tech and it's what I'm doing here is uh, I'm cutting and boosting the same amount at 100 hertz, which if you're familiar with pull techs will make perfect sense why I'm doing that. And if you're not, you're kind of probably wondering why is he boosting and cutting at the same time? And the reason is because they have different... Uh, slopes. So the cut is actually much broader than the boost. And what ends up happening is that the mids end up getting opened up a little bit. So that area where the kick is living, it's kind of making a little bit of room for it there. Now, again, a lot of the times we're not necessarily trying to make room, but I don't think it's a coincidence that I ended up doing it on this 808. And I also ended up doing it in the tutorial section when I didn't necessarily expect to be. It just, it helped. And I'm, it, it doesn't end up being that dramatic, actually. Because the boost and the cut are both pulled up to the same amount, the difference is really only a couple of dB, like maybe one or two dB, something like that. So it's not like a massive change to the low end and the low mids. It's a slight change. It's also doing the service of bringing up the sub range. And then on top of that, I'm also bringing up the 3K and giving it that extra bit of texture, that like buzz tone that's in the 808. And I'm also cutting at 10K because there's some clickiness and some weird fizziness that really just doesn't need to be there. So if I solo up the 808, I'll, I'll bypass the CQ and bring it in. It sounds like this. So it stands a little bit taller, but overall it's not a major difference. I think we're actually going to hear the difference a little bit more distinctly in the record itself. So it's interesting because it doesn't really change the the actual like way the low end 
feels in terms of like how it sounds frequency wise, but it opens the whole low end up and makes it feel like it's a whole lot more alive, which is a really nice little thing to sort of have nothing change, but everything change. Sometimes that's really the goal. Uh, looks like I've got a similar EQ, you know, a little different because the kick is not in, but a similar EQ on the uh, areas where the 808 is not the same notice or where the kick is not present with the 808. Notice though that I do have slightly less cut to that 100 hertz area because the kick is not in. So I'm just allowing the 808 to fill in that range a little bit more. And then here I actually have the FG Bomber bypassed. And the reason is because I ended up liking it feeling like it was more like going from a sustainy 808 into a more punchy 808. That contrast I felt helped the song at the end of the day. So that's a little different than what we did in the tutorial. But again, that's it's a very subjective situation. Sometimes we're going to want to make up for it. Sometimes we're going to want to directly and deliberately contrast it. So it's really going to depend. Uh, and then no, no low end processing on this. And I don't think I'm going to put any low end processing on this. Sometimes if the sounds are too clean or the sounds don't necessarily naturally blend, like the kick and the 808, they don't necessarily completely gel. What I'll do is I'll take a saturator and I will put a little bit of distortion over both the kick and the 808 at the same time. And if I'm doing that, I'll, I'll use a saturator like the black box because it also applies some compression. So that allows everything to kind of gel together and become kind of gluey and pillowy and create this like really nice foundation for all other elements to kind of build on top of. In this particular case, there's already really good saturation and texture in the 808 and the kick already sounds like it really belongs with the 808. They blend really, really well. So I don't think I need to actually do any kind of bus processing on this, but it is something that I keep in back of my mind in case I feel that I do have the need to do that. And I actually have a demonstration on my YouTube channel where uh, I do have a record where I was doing that. And it's a demonstration of the black box specifically. So, all right, guys, that'll wrap up this tutorial. Basically, you know, it's, it's not too different than mixing other genres, except for being cognizant that you want the low end to really be as dominant as possible without taking away from the rest of the record. But, you know, if it feels like the low end is just a little too loud, it's probably just right. And then also finding that perfect blend between the kick and whatever low end elements are present, usually an 808, pretty much sums up the genre. All right, guys, I, I hope that you learned something. Uh, if you dig what I'm doing here, you know, let, let the people know. It's always good to collaborate with Warren and do something for Produce Like a Pro because I love the channel and I love the education that they provide. Uh, otherwise, you know the drill. We are musicians. Sound is our instrument. And I will catch you next time.